uh, amount to our audience because I had him in the past where he gave us two other excellent uh, lectures. He is professor of classics at Northwestern University. He has received a BA in National Degree from Columbia University, BA and MA degrees in classics from Oxford in England, and a PhD in classical philology from Harvard. He has been a visiting professor at the American School of Athens, at Pisa, Siena, Trento, Orvino, and Santusha, most of Italy as a <laughs> There's also some 98 articles on British history, government, law, uh, numismatics, and music theory. Actually, the first lecture he gave to us was on national theory of numismatics. His books include The Aeropagos Council, the 307 BC, and the second book, Destruction of Daemon Music, Wisdom, Teaching, and, polit and Politics in Pericles Athens. He has co authored Origins of Democracy in Nation Greece and the Aristotle's Constitution of the Athenians, and he has co edited four volumes in Greek music theory, drama, history, and law. His current book projects include Thucydides, Sophocles, and Plato as a writer. So, definitely, you are going to have a day in the future to talk to us about his books on Sophocles, then the book on Plato. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Welcome to our lecture program. Thank you so much, uh, Costas. Let's yeah. attach this if I can. Can you still hear me through it? Okay. Kalis <clears throat> Berasas. Uh, <laughs> it's always a wonderful pleasure to be. Uh, I'm a great fan of, of Greece and of the Greek people and the Greek country. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. So I'm most grateful. Let's see if I can attach this. Let's try that. Oh, that's not very good. Too low. <laughs> uh, my shirt. I'll try that. Are you coming to help me? That's it. I'm a classicist. I don't know how to do things like attach microphones. <laughs> Try that. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Not too loud, not too, too quiet. Um, <clears throat> I once, my Areopagus book once won a prize when I was teaching at Johns Hopkins. And the dean therefore took me to lunch because he said, everybody, if you get a prize, I take you to lunch. And he asked me, how on earth, after 2,500 years, how on earth can there be anything left to say about these Greek authors? And the answer is, there's a, when you, what I, at Oxford, when I was a student there, I learned a lot of things. Almost all of those things, we don't believe anymore. You just keep looking at the material and thinking about it. And um, it's extraordinary how people have believed things that we think currently are crazy. And probably 50 years from now, what I'm gonna tell you tonight is crazy. But um, I've been working on Thucydides for 50 years. Uh, I love Thucydides. He's a very difficult and complex author. Um, but uh, this time around, I saw something. And so I'm gonna share that with you tonight. And you can see what you think about it. I'm, I'm very excited. Once upon a time at a drama conference at Northwestern where I teach, at lunch, I happened to be seated next to two Hollywood script writers. They wrote the screenplays for detective shows like uh, Miami Vice and Law and Order and CSI. These two guys nearly fell off the cha their chairs when I told them that while for each TV show, they're different characters, 
and different settings, different houses, and the story is almost invariably the same. There's a crime, a police investigation, various people seem suspicious, but the worst guy is never the criminal. Also, often one guy who was bad, um, but has become good, redeems himself, but he will get killed because earlier he had committed some crimes and he has to pay for it. At the end, the police catch the guilty guy. All those detective stories have this very same plot, which we don't notice because the people are different and the house is different. Um, and of course, tragically in our society, these stories aren't true. Most of the police, tragically, often the police don't behave as they should. They don't hunt and, and get the right guy, but we want to think that they do. And so we watch these shows and when we turn off the show, we, we are satisfied. The bad guy has been caught. Our society functions. The French tried doing it differently at one point in the late 50s and early 60s with something they called film noir, black film, where the good guy at the end gets killed and the, the bad guys go off and have a beer at the bar. People don't want to see that. They think that's, I'm not watching that, that's terrible. Uh, now the ancient Greek stories were similar, similarly formulaic. Uh, the plots are very similar. Um, in particular, if you behave badly, you will be punished. The Greeks, the ancient Greeks also wanted justice to prevail. The Iliad opens with a dispute between Agamemnon and the Greeks' greatest warrior, Achilles. Agamemnon offends Achilles by taking his war prize, the young woman, Briseis. In anger, Achilles stops fighting, causing the deaths of thousands of Greeks, and finally, the death of his closest friend, Patroclus. So Achilles comes to realize that he was wrong not to fight for his community, and he rejoins the war. Um, <clears throat> In the Odyssey, young Telemachus heads off to find his father and he learns, he finds his father and he learns or what happened to him and he finds his father and he learns to use his father's sword, uh, father's bow, beca thus becoming a man. These patterns of young men growing to, to maturity and taking the place of their father you can trace this on down to modern times. So in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker doesn't know who his father is or where he is. And so he sets off to find him and he learns to use the lightsaber. It's exactly the same story. And the reason is that in every society, young men grow up and take the place of their father. Athenian tragedies offer a large number of such stories. My friend Peter Burian, who's a classics professor at Duke uh, and a fine scholar of tragedy, he describes tragedies, and I quote him, most widely accepted master narrative as a schema emphasizing hamartia, which is generally understood as the tragic flaw of overweening pride, hubris, and its punishment. The tragic hero is destroyed by the gods or fate. 
because of his own failings, by a mistaken judgment, he, uh, he, uh, and he learns by suffering. Oedipus, is, we all, we've all read Oedipus Rex, Oedipus Turanos, although Sophocles' title for it was the, just the Oedipus. But after, wrote, after he wrote the Oedipus at Colonus, librarians had to distinguish his original play, the Oedipus, from the Oedipus at Colonus. So they started to call the Oedipus, the Oedipus Turanos, but that wasn't its original title. Um, uh, Oedipus, um, his tragic flaws are overweening pride and anger. He starts out well, wishing only to help his people of Thebes, which is besieged by a plague and people are dying and the crops are dying and the animals are dying. He wants to help his people. But in his opening speech, he calls himself, he says, I am famous Oedipus. <laughs> and that by himself, without the help of the gods, he solved the riddle of the Sphinx and thus helped rescue Thebes. Um, and also anger. Um, People, scholars have wondered, well, Oedipus was fated to kill his father and marry his mother. So it wasn't his fault that he did those things because it was fate. Um, however, Oedipus describes the scene where he killed his father at a crossroads. He said this wagon with four men in it came barreling down as I was walking along. And the old man, he didn't know that was his father. The old man swings a club at him to drive him out of the road. And Oedipus gets angry and he kills all four of the men. Uh, and so you see, he has overstepped. He's killed four people, not just his father who tried to knock him out of the way. So he wasn't entirely innocent of this offense. And the rest of the play shows him degenerating into tyranny. He's called, he calls himself a tyrant. And that's why uh, early scribes called him Oedipus Turanos, because he says, I'm the tyrant. I get to do what I want. He is behaving badly. And of course, he learns that it was he, because he had killed his father and married his mother. It was he who was causing the pollution on his city. So Oedipus was guilty and he is driven out of Thebes as a result. So too, the historian Herodotus, he wrote a history of the Persian Wars just a little bit before Thucydides, a few years before Thucydides, uh, which is a series of stories in which rulers or cities start out well, but descend into violence or crime and are crushed. You may remember some of these stories. Candaules, who thought his wife was so beautiful that he wanted to show her naked to the captain of the guards. The captain of the guards is I don't want to do this. It's not, it's not right. And, but uh, he forces him to do it. And uh, the wife um, goes to bed, change, changes into her pajamas. The captain of the guard sees her naked. And he, he's able to slip out without her. When she goes to bed, he slips out. But she had seen him. And she calls him in the next day and says, my husband, I know what happened. My husband did this. And he did a bad thing by showing me to you naked. So you have a choice. Either kill my husband and you become king, or I'll have you killed. So, Gai so Kandal Gaijis makes the right call. 
and he becomes king. <laughs> it's a great little story because Candaules did a bad thing and he has to be punished for it. Herodotus has the story of Croesus, the Candaules, then Croesus, two Persian kings, Cyrus and Xerxes, who also descended to violence and are, are overthrown. And finally, Athens, whose fate in the Peloponnesian War is foreshadowed by Herodotus when Pericles' father, Xanthippus, see, Pericles, Herodotus was writing in the late 420s, 430s and early 420s. Pericles dies in 429. Pericles, the great leader of Athens, democracy. His father, Herodotus records, that his father, Xanthippus, and the Athenians, when they've driven the Persians out of Greece, Xanthippus and the Athenians crucify the Persian governor of Sestos at the Hellespont and stone his son to death before his eyes. A terrible act. Herodotus is here warning the Athenians against hubris just at the start of the Peloponnesian War. The accounts of five city-states, poles, as we call them, the, the accounts of five poles drive Thucydides' history. Corsaira, Plataea, Sparta, Athens, and Syracuse. Thucydides organized his history year by year, which has the effect of separating the histories of these five cities into different sections of his book. So for example, the first episode concerns Corsaira, uh, which is Corfu. Uh, and the first occurrence occur occurs at 124 to 55. And then we return to the story in book three, 70 to 81. And then we return to the end of the story in book four, 46 to 49. Um, the story is broken up um, because he does, he goes year by year, whatever happens at 429, all of it, and then 428, and then 427. If you reassemble these five histories of the city state, these, the histories of these five city states, if you reassemble them into one single account each, the history of Corsaira, history of Plataea, etc., what happens in them is the same. Uh, all five cities misbehave by killing war captives and committing sacrilege. And all of them are then punished. After which Corsaira and Plataea disappear. Sparta and Athens are temporar temporarily redeemed as we will see, um, but they will fall in the end as in historical fact does Syracuse. Although Thucydides um, stopped writing before he got to the end of Syracuse in Sicily. Now, before and now we're about to swing into the main, the main act. So let me just tell you a few things about Thucydides, which will help you understand what he's up to. He was born around 460. He, was, he came from an elite family. He was an upper class man. His family, two members of his family, were both political conservatives. Thucydides, son of Milesius, who was the head of the conservative, the aristocratic faction, and Cimon, 
who was Pericles' great rival, Pericles being democratic and Thucydides and his family being uh, aristocratic or oligarchic. Um, however, the striking fact about Thucydides is while he hated democracy as an elite member of the elite class, he loved Pericles, who was the head of the democracy. And so some of the tensions in reading Thucydides comes from the, because he, when he praises Pericles, he doesn't want at the same time to praise what he does, which is lead the democracy. So this, I don't know, some of you may have heard of the funeral oration, very famous speech that Thucydides writes for Pericles. This, what we have was, we all agree, not given by Pericles, but it was written by Thucydides for Pericles. And it's filled with paradoxes, precisely because he wants to praise Pericles but he doesn't want to praise the people, the, the, the demos. So it makes for very interesting reading. Um, Thucydides was educated by a man called Antiphon, who was a sophisticated contemporary intellectual, a sophist, highly intelligent, highly original, he was banished by the democracy in 411. So he too was not in favor of democracy. Uh, but Thucydides, we are told by later sources that Thucydides writing style, which is tortured, um, that his writing style looked a lot like Antiphon's style. And of course, the amazing thing about Thucydides is he wrote. Herodotus wrote to be read aloud. Nobody, very few people read like we do. They would go and have somebody read it. People would gather and somebody would read aloud. And that's what Herodotus did. But Thucydides did not. He did not perform his text. Uh, so Thucydides was a highly educated upper class anti-democrat, but he learned also to be a general. He was a military general and fought for Athens. However, in 424, he was exiled for military incompetence. The joke we classicists have is because his writing is so complicated that he was exiled because the soldiers couldn't understand his commands. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, he was exiled in 424 um, and was not allowed to come back until after the war. Uh, he spent his exile in Northern Greece um, and near Halkidiki uh, and wrote, and he said it was great because I heard both sides. I got the Spartan side of this Peloponnesian War. I heard the Athenian side. So I ended up being very well informed about what was happening in this war. Um, one of the curious things about the fifth century is that most people didn't just do one thing. Sophocles, the playwright, also was a great, a fine general. Um, and uh, Thuc so Thucydides, he was a general. He was a brilliant but tortured writer. Um, he, he studied medicine um, because, as you may know, Athens was subjected to a plague broke out about 431 and was still with them in 426. And he very carefully describes the symptoms of this disease. He says, in order that when it comes, when and if it comes back, people will know what it is and will know what is going to happen to you. Doctors in this early period 
didn't know how to cure many things, but they were good at prognosis. They would say, what you have is, and they would tell you your disease, and they'd say, now, we have traced this disease in the following sequence, and that's what is likely to happen to you. And that's what he says. I write, describe this plague um, to um, allow people to diagnose it uh, if it ever comes back. And that's why in another section of Thucydides, he says, that's why I'm writing this history because actions repeat themselves. And one thing will happen here. And a little bit later, that same thing will happen somewhere else. And you see, I gave you, I told you there are these five stories of the history of five city-states and they're the same. There we get it. History repeats itself. Um, and just like a disease. So he was interested in, he was a military man. And in fact, very often when the combatants get up and give speeches, this guy and then his enemy, almost always the second thing they talk about is the, uh, their resources. How many soldiers they have, how many ships, um, who are the generals, or they have enough of everything, weapons, and whatnot. That's the eye of the general saying that the general is going to talk about equipment because he was a general and he had to worry about supplies. Oh, and I should not have passed this by. Thucydides has these very famous speeches in his history. There, there are deeds and there are speeches. And the speeches, are in some ways the most interesting part. They include Thucydides' deepest thoughts. And here's the thing, they were, you know, so Chemo, not, not Pericles gives speeches and Alcibiades gives speeches. Thucydides wrote all those speeches. Um, I, I say this with absolute confidence. Um, he, Thucydides says at the beginning, his preface, he says, well, I include speeches and I have the speakers say what they ought to say in my view, because it's hard to remember exactly what they said. So I have them what, say what they ought to have said, plus in general form, what they did say. So if somebody recommends continue fighting with Sparta rather than making peace with Sparta. They did say that. But the bulk of the speech is written by Thucydides. He thinks they sh this is what they should have said. Um, and we'll see a few examples of this. It's fascinating. Um, so he was a military man. He had studied medical science hist and history as a disease. He was a political scientist. He was really interested in how politics works. Um, and in fact, um, his work is still studied by, by many political scientists and by many military historians. Until very recently, it was a required reading at all four military academies in the United States, West Point, et cetera. Um, he has, for example, a very famous account of a revolutionary period in 427. Um, and he says, things fell apart, now fell apart. And one of his points is words change their meaning. And so, Words like courage often meant helping your political associate kill some enemies. And the whole, everybody's behavior, it's a fascinating passage. I wish I had time to read it to you. It's very famous. So Thucydides wrote this history of the war between Athens and Sparta um, that started in 431. 
and ended in 404. What was the war about? Um, Sparta had a league, the Peloponnesian League, which had all the people in Western Greece, the, Pelopon the Peloponnese and Corinth and Megara. Um, uh, Thebes also was a member. Athens had the Delian League with over 300 city-states as members that was mostly in the Aegean, the islands and Anatolia, Western Anatolia. And Athens was a city full of energy. In the very, in the third speech that Thucydides gives by Athens' enemy, Corinth, Corinth was allied with Sparta. They didn't like Athens. And what, what started the war is that Athens, as a powerful naval force, as were Megara, Aegina, and Corinth, all three important naval powers, but Athens was stronger. And these three city-states thought that Athens was getting in their way and blocking them. And Heracles passed his famous Megarian decree. The Megarians, he, Heracles was almost uniquely a warmonger. He thought the, the way to get ahead is to start wars and defeat our enemies, and then they won't bother us anymore. So he provoked all these wars. And so he provoked a fight with Megara, ally of Sparta, um, and then claimed that the Megarians had misbehaved. And so they could no longer sail into any of the 300 harbors in the Athenian League, which was very difficult for a trading power like Megara. If you've been to Megara, it doesn't have great agricultural land, but it's a great place for shipping, but they couldn't do it. And so they went to Sparta and said, Athens is being terrible to us, uh, blocking us. And Corinth objected to, uh, Corinth objected and Aegina objected to the Athenians. So they went to Sparta and said, Sparta, you've got to help us. You're the head of our league and you've got to help us against Athens. Sparta didn't want to. Why? because they suffered from something called oligantropia. They had a declining population. In fact, Sparta disappears in the next century because for some reason, they weren't producing enough children. We don't know why. And so the number of Spartan warriors was declining. And so they did not want to fight. Um, so um, a battle starts between Epidamnus, which is actually high up, it's now on Albania, Epidamnus and Corfu, Corsaira, and um, Corinth had founded Epidamnus. And so there was trouble between these two cities. And so Epidamnus went to Corinth and said, can you help us? And Corinth then, and then Corsaira then went to Athens and said, the Corinthians are about to go against us and they're a big power and they're Sparta's ally. War hasn't started yet, but can you help us? And Athens agreed. And so the war, and, and who said to the Athenians, we have to help Corsaira? It was Pericles, but Thucydides doesn't say that. He doesn't tell us that. Plutarch tells us, but not Thucydides. And so um, per Pericles is provoking a war. He really is, he provokes this war. And what's incredible, half of the first book of Thucydides is on the outbreak of the war. And 
We don't see Pericles until the second, the war is already broken out before Pericles appears in Thucydides. But Thucydides says straight away, it was Pericles who caused this war. But I tell you, most scholars, because he doesn't, the war seems to have broken out before Pericles even got on the scene. So most scholars think, no, it was Sparta that started it. That's what Thucydides wanted you to think. Um, but it was Pericles who did this because he was a warmonger. Now, Sparta didn't want war. Did the Athenians want war? They did not. The Athenians had wars against the Persians in the first half of the fifth century, but they got sick of it. They had a big campaign in Egypt and Phoenicia uh, in which they fought for six years, uh, five years from 455 down to 450, and they lost thousands of men. And so they made peace with Persia. And then in 446, they made peace with Sparta. Every war after that was provoked by Pericles. The Athenians, Pericles tried to convince them to start the war. They didn't want to. Isn't this incredible? It's a remarkable fact. They didn't want to because they were fine. They were living in peace. And all their, all their allies, the Delian League members, the 300 city-states, Everybody was living in peace. And it was Pericles who provoked this. So um, there was the Corsaira Epidamnus episode um, where Athens starts to help Corsaira fight Corinth, an important ally of Sparta. Then the second episode is Plataea. Uh, Plataea, that's up in, in Philae. If you, between Athens and Boeotia. Um, and um, uh, it was a long time ally of Athens, um, but they did a bad thing. The Thebans hate, hated Plataea. Um, and so some Thebans invaded the town at night this is the opening of book two and for Thucydides. See, Thucydides doesn't say the war started with Corsaira and Epidamnus because that was Pericles' fault and he didn't want to mention it because he loved Pericles. Second book, he says, the war now starts with Plataea against Thebes. Um, and uh, the, some, some Thebans invade Plataea but the Plataeans drive them out and capture 180 of them and want to kill them. Athens sent a message to the Plataeans, don't do that. But the Plataeans do it. The Plataeans prompt, if they said to the Thebans, if you surrender, we won't harm you, but they kill them all. But Athens tried to prevent that. So Athens in book one, Athens allies with Corsaira, which is not a good thing to do. But Athens now was doing right, protecting Thebans who weren't their friends. But they told the Plataeans, the Thebans don't kill them, but the Plataeans do. So Athens is looking pretty good. Then we get this large pause of four episodes, we get the funeral oration um, where Pericles gives us, it's a it happened every year that Athenians were fighting. Somebody at the end of the fighting season, they had a communal burial for all the, war, the dead warriors. And somebody gave a speech praising Athens and praising the democracy. And Pericles gave the speech in this first year of the war. Um, it's a, a masterpiece of deception and confusion because Thucydides who wrote it didn't want to praise the democracy. He didn't want to praise the people, many of whom had died. Um, 
And so Pericles says a lot of really strange things. Um, like one great thing about war is a lot of bad people die. You know, we don't have to think about their evil anymore. We just think that they were good because they died for the city. Now, that's not a great thing to say in a eulogy. You're supposed to say, oh, everybody was brave and they all fought for the city. And he says, a lot of guys died. They were bad people. And we all know that. So we're glad they're gone. But they, and they at least died nobly. There are a lot of things like this. And you look at it and think, what's going on? And that's because Thucydides wrote it and didn't want to say nice things about ordinary Athenians because he was upper class. So complicated. Then Pericles praises Athens. Then there's the plague. And the plague contradicts all the good points that Pericles had said about Athens. He said, you know, people with the plague, nobody stopped, everybody stopped believing in the gods. Um, and if they thought it doesn't matter because I'm going to die anyway, everybody stopped behaving properly. You know, it just doesn't, who cares? Uh, get drunk, you know, have sex. Who cares? Because we're going to die. It's an extraordinary passage. Then there is Pericles' last speech, which is very dark and bitter. And he, in particular, he says, our empire is a tyranny. We run it like a tyranny. It was wrong to take it. Wow. And then the last, the fourth episode of this little group, they start fighting and there are no speeches or anything in this little two paragraphs. The Spartans start fighting and the Athenians start fighting and both are vicious and murderous. They just capture anybody and like any merchant on the sea, they, they capture people and just kill them, throw their bodies in a, in a, in a pit. Both of them do it. Because Thucydides, one of his big ideas is war is a teacher of violence. The Ios didaskalos. Um, and everybody's behavior goes in the toilet as a result of war. So things are dark. So, and the war is now on. So let me just see, I don't wanna miss an episode here, hang on. Oh, I, I got just a little ahead. Let me just go back because there's right, I mentioned to you, my, my basic thesis, I will tell you, is that the Athenians especially watched tragedies. Tra Greek tragedies were all written in Athens. Every year there were nine of them put on in the theater of Dionysus. And these plays then circulated around the countryside in local theaters because they had no TVs or radios. So everybody wanted to see the plays. So everybody saw the plays. It was the biggest form of popular culture. And these plays are remarkable. One of the great human accomplishments because they're so complex. This is popular entertainment. It's like TV, but these are complex, thoughtful, just extraordinary productions. And we still read them today and debate them. It's remarkable. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, there is a basic plot, which is that some something, some, somebody like Oedipus starts out well. He says, I want to help the city and get rid of the plague. And I want to, I will do nothing. I will not take any rest until I find the solution. But then he turns tyrannical. He says, I'm the king. I, whatever I say is the law. He turns bad. Uh, and then he falls and is driven out of, of Athens, of Thebes, rather. This is the pattern that Peter Burian said. The standard view is 
that there's a hero who suffers from excessive pride um, and he does bad things and then he is destroyed. That's Thucydides model for his history. This he thought is what happened to Athens, the Athenian democracy. Uh, right at the beginning, the Athenians don't want to kill prisoners. They try to help, but then they progressively get worse. The next episode is the Mytilenean revolt. That happened in right in, in the opening of book three. Uh, Lesbos was controlled by an aristocracy. And the aristocrats disarmed the people and revolted from Athens. And so Athens attacks. And Athens wins. Um, because Athens was a democracy. Among the 300 city states, the governments that were democratic. They loved Athens and Athens loved them. But if it was an aristocratic government that was anti-democracy, that was more complicated. And so trouble sometimes ar arose. So the Mytilenean elite revolted. They were beaten by the Athenians. And then the question is what to do about the Mytilenians who had revolted. So they have a meeting in Athens, an assembly. And the so-called demagogue, Thucydides hates this man, but we like him now. He's been redeemed, Cleon. Um, Cleon, Thucydides writes a horrible speech for Cleon saying, well, it's true that only the elite organized this revolt, the demos was not at fault, but who cares? We've got to be hard, we've got to be firm, kill them all, kill all the men and sell the women and children into slavery. And the Athenians vote for that. Now, here's where it gets fascinating because that night, the Millenians change their mind and they think we were too cruel. And so they meet again, another assembly the next day. But that first day, after they just condemned all the Mytilenians, they sent a ship to Mytilene to tell the Athenian army, which was waiting there to find out what to do, to tell them, kill, kill all the men. Um, the next day, while that ship was going, making its way to Mytilene, the next day, the, um, they had another meeting. Assembly, the Athenians had another assembly. And many people, Thucydides says, many people spoke, many of them in sympathy with the Mytilenians. They shouldn't do this. Thucydides gives us two speeches. He quotes two speeches of these many. Cleon again, who continues to say, we can't show mercy, everybody else will revolt, kill them all. And a guy called Diodotus, who says, well, I don't think we should kill the Mytilenians, but um, the reason for that is um, that it's in our best, it, I don't, he says, I don't care about justice. Ooh. And we've seen already justice is an important theme in Thucydides. I don't care about justice. I only care about what's in Athens' interest. And for various reasons, which he explains, I think it's better not to kill these Mytilenians. For example, other people who revolt will never surrender if they know they're just going to kill us if we surrender. So he has arguments like this. And, but the, so the Athenians vote for Diodotus, but it's a really cruel speech. And those two speeches were written by Thucydides. Thucydides, however, has told us 
First, that the Athenians changed their mind about killing the Midlanians after the first assembly. And then he says, the boat taking the instructions to kill all the Midlanians uh, that had been sent on the first day was going really slowly because they, they didn't want to do it. And then after they voted to spare the Midlanians, they Everybody volunteers to go super fast and they got double rations and they got they rode all night and they got out there just in time. So you can see it's not the Athenians who are bad, it's Thucydides who is on this tragic jag. The Athenians start out good, but then they start being bad. And he paints these in these two speeches. He makes them look bad, but their actions that he reports make them look good. The next episode is one that involves Sparta uh, and Plataea. I won't go into it because I'll tell you in a nutshell, Thucydides also shows that Sparta was bad, but then as Athens gets worse and worse, the Spartans get better and better. Um, the Plataeans, in a nutshell, the Plataeans were tried um, for killing those Thebans, the 180 Thebans that I mentioned at the start of the war. What was the noise? It sounded like it was about to collapse. Um, so, um, the Spartans um, do a bad thing. They condemn all the Plataeans um, because they think we want Thebes to be on our side. So for totally selfish reasons, they condemn the 180 Thebans to death. Um, and um, uh, so we get that story. And then a, a signal story. Um, the, there's a very brave Athenian general called Demosthenes, not the orator of the next century, but there's an orator. Uh, uh, there's a general called Demosthenes and he traps some Spartans on the island of Sphacteria down by Pylos. I hope you've all been to Pylos uh, in the Southern Peloponnese. He, he captures them on the island and the thing the Spartans don't want is to lose any men. So the Athenians hold these Spartans as prisoners and Sparta surrenders because it wants it to get its men back. And that's because that's their most important thing. So the Athenians win the war. Now Thucydides has been thinking the Athenians are gonna, because they're bad and they're evil the Democrats, they're gonna lose the war. And he's been getting things worse and worse and worse. All of a sudden, Athens wins. Um, and for the next five years is peace. Few little things happen here and there because Corinth and Megara and Aegina are not happy with this peace because Sparta hadn't done anything for them. And so book five of Thucydides, which recounts this five-year period, nothing much goes on until we get to the end. Earlier, we had heard about a little island called Milos, still there, still got that name, founded by the Spartans or settled by the Spartans. And it was a member of the Athenian, because it was an island, Athenian Delian League, but they stopped paying tribute to Athens. Tribute was not much. It was the amount, the city of Miletus, a major, major city, it was a huge, you know, what did they pay? They paid five talents of silver a year. 
A talent, 60 pounds of silver, was enough to keep one ship in the water for one month. So Miletus got the protection of the Athenian fleet, 400 triremes. Um, and all they had to pay was the price of one ship in the water for five months. It was a tremendous deal. And that's why, see, those who say the allies hate Thucydides, like Thucydides, says the allies all hated Athens and wanted to escape. As soon as the war broke out in 431, all the allies had to do was say, guess what, Athens? We're not fighting this with you. We didn't sign up to fight Sparta. We signed up to fight Persia. They didn't. They helped Athens against Sparta. They very rarely was there a revolt like Middle Eni did because it was ruled by not a democracy by the upper, the upper classes. It's another extraordinary thing. Uh, this was discovered by a brilliant British historian called Geoffrey de Saint Croix uh, in the 1950-51. And yet still my blessed colleagues don't believe him, but they will. Uh, Geoffrey was a genius. So, um, Milos, which was founded by the Spartans, and there was no war going on anymore, they decided not to pay tribute anymore to Athens. So, and you can read it in Thucydides, the allies and Athens attacked. They said, you, you, we, you have to pay your share. It's not very much. You have to pay. And the Melians refuse. So the first thing that happened once and the Athenians just left, but now it happened again. And the Athenians attacked Milos in 416. And Thucydides writes, everybody agrees, all scholars agree, Thucydides wrote the Melian dialogue. It is savage. The Athenians tell the Melians, we're bigger than you are. We're going to crush you unless you help, unless you pay your share. And the Melians say, well, we rely on hope. Maybe the Spartans will come and help us. And the, the Athenians say, hope is for the desperate. The people who indulge in hope are people who have no resources and they are going to get squashed. Anybody who relies on hope is going to get squashed. The Melians say, we'll rely on the gods. The Melians say, the Athenians say, the gods help those who help themselves. If you're weak and puny, you're going to get nothing. It's a savage document. And the Melians, at the end, say, no, we're just going to, we're not going to pay. And the Athenians crush them, kill everybody, all the, kill all the men. Remember, they didn't do that in Mytilene. But now they do. They kill all the men and sell the women and children to slavery. And the very next sentence is, the Athenians now decide to attack Sicily and to conquer the whole island. And in 450, so they, they decide to do this. And for the next two books out of eight in Thucydides, we get the Sicilian expedition. It is, it's extraordinary. This is, this is my big discovery. I hope it's gonna make me famous. It's really exciting because it's right there in the text. So the Athenians, the very first line of book six is the Athenians decide, I'll read it to you, six. Five. That's the Melian dialogue. Um, uh, yeah, the Melians say, uh, we trust that the gods will give us fortune as good as yours, because we stand for what is right against what is wrong. And the Athenians say, as far as the favor of the gods is concerned, we think we have as much right to that as you. Our aims and our actions are perfectly consistent with the beliefs men hold 
about the gods and about the principles that govern their own conduct. Um, and uh, uh, we think that is, it is a general and necessary law of nature to rule whatever you can. We didn't make this law and we weren't the first to act upon it. We found it already in existence and we shall leave it to exist forever among those who come after us. See, this is the famous sophistic doctrine of uh, might makes right. Um, uh, it, it is a general and necessary law of nature to rule whatever one can. Um, so we're just following the law of nature, not human laws, but natural laws. It's, it was a big debate at the time. Um, I hope I'm inspiring some of you to read Thucydides. <laughs> He's utterly extraordinary. And so here is the opening sentence, if I can find it, of book six. Uh, oh, somewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, so here it is. The old first sentence, right after me lost. In the same winter, the Athenians resolved to sail against Sicily with larger forces than those which Lachis and Eurymedon had commanded, and if possible, to conquer it. Um, so, uh, and then he gives a little history of Sicily, and then he starts in again. Um, these were the peoples that Greek and foreign that inhabited Sicily. Uh, and this it was this island that the Athenians were now so eager to attack. They aimed at conquering the whole of it. Although they wanted at the same time to make it look as though they were sending help to their own kinsmen and to their newly acquired allies there. Athens, we have the stones. Athens made an alliance with two Sicilian cities Leontini, which is about a 35 minute drive north of Syracuse, right on the southern eastern coast of Sicily. So there's Syracuse and above it Leontini, and then over just beyond Palermo, uh, Segesta. Um, and Athens made an agreement with these two cities in the 430s or 420s, and these, these agreements said, if they ever need help uh, in war, that Athens will help them. And so Athens had an obligation, a treaty obligation. So everything was peaceful now. In the Aegean, the Spartans weren't fighting, nothing was going on. And so Leontini and Segesta come knocking and they say, you know, we're having trouble suggested with Selinunte down on the southern coast and Leontini with Syracuse, 35 minute drives below them. Um, and so they said, we, we need your help. And so the Athenians had promised to help. And so they do. Well, they debate what to do. And Thucydides says, the Athenians decide to conquer the whole of Sicily. Now the Athenians had never actually done that. They never conquered whole territories. They got al allies because every town had Democrats and aristocrats. And they would convince the they, would, they were always friendly with the democratic towns. If there was an aristocratic town, they were happy to welcome a revolution against the aristocrats by the Democrats, but they wouldn't take over the town. They would just let the Democrats run because they were easier to work with. Whereas Thucydides says the Athenians wanted to rule the whole of the island, something they had never done. So that's what he says, and he repeats it again. Although three pages later, that 
a prominent Athenian general called Nicias, who is not militarily gung ho. He starts, Thucydides says, he starts, Nicias starts thinking, and he thinks, I know what the Athenians really want to do. They want to conquer the whole island, not just help Segesta and Leontini. And see, that passage means the Athenians did not say in the assembly, we should go conquer Sicily. Nicias, five, he says, five days after the meeting, he's thinking, he says, I don't think the Athenians are just going to help these two small towns. I think what they really want to do is conquer the island. Nobody said it. And uh, they then choose three generals to go. And one of the generals is Nicias, who doesn't want to do it. One is a professional soldier named Lamachus, and one is a, um, a gung-ho, kind of eager beaver guy called Alcibiades. So they choose these three, and Plutarch says it's because they didn't know what they would find in Sicily, whether these would be good, this would be, they would present good opportunities for Athenian expansion or not. So send three generals of different views, including one of them is a professional soldier. And they only send 60 ships. They have 400. They send only 60. And when they get out there, the three generals huddle. What should we do? Nicias says, let's just go home. Alcibiades says, no, we can't do that. They sent us out here, we gotta do something. So we'll just sail around and make a show of the Athenian flag. And if there's some, somebody who wants to ally with us, good. And Lamachus, the professional soldier says, my view is we should attack Syracuse because Syracuse was a Dorian ally of Sparta. And that was the main danger that in the Peloponnesian War, that city would get involved helping Sparta. And that's really why the Athenians were there actually to keep Syracuse quiet. They wanted to show, have a show of force, not to conquer the island. And, um, but Thucydides says they wanted to conquer the island to make them look bad. That these, this is a gung-ho democracy, bloodthirsty. They had this idea to conquer Thucydides. So the three generals that are sent, none of them says, let's conquer Sicily. One does say, let's attack Syracuse, but that actually made sense. Uh, but Lamachus says, well, I'll go with Alcibiades. We'll just sail around, show the flag, see if we can get some more allies, then go home. That's what it was. And then, by gum, the Athenians, the fleet gets out there near Palermo to help Segesta against Selinunte. And Thucydides gives it half a paragraph. And then he says, without saying at all what the Athenians did, evidently nothing. They then went to help Leontini, the other treaty obligation. And um, uh, it happened that Leontini was being attacked by Syracuse, their neighbor to the south. And the Athenians get there and they don't stop. They go over to Catania, which is on the coast and a little further north and they camp for a whole winter. They're supposed to be helping Leontini against Syracuse. They don't do anything. And the Syracusans go to ride up to them and say, what do you wanna live here or something? What's your deal? Why don't you fight us? The, Syracuse, the Athenians don't, Finally, they're embarrassed. So that little few skirmishes happen. And the Syracusans are on top of things. 
and they know the territory and everything, and they trap the Athenians. There are big, several big battles, and the Syracusans win. That's it. That's it. It's nothing. It's nothing. Thucydides port portrays this as the culminating outrage that Athens wants to conquer Sicily and is crushed because of their outrageous hubris. He uses that word, their hubris. But the Athenians didn't mean to do that at all. And you can see it right in the pages of Thucydides. It is extraordinary that nobody has seen this. The Athenians were not trying to attack Syracuse. They didn't want to. Syracusans attacked them and they won. Wow. So Thucydides, want, he builds up this military episode and has Athens uh, defeated because that's the pattern. Somebody starts out good, gets worse and worse, and he misrepresents what they do in Mytilene. He misrepresents what they do in Milos. Then there's Sicily where they are supposedly punished. He fits this chunk of history into the traditional story that we see in Greek tragedy that everybody is used to, but it's not true. And this is historically of great importance because you may be aware that the United States does not actually have a democracy. They don't actually ask our opinion, the, we the people, about anything. Um, they, uh, uh, we, for every four years we vote for a president, but that doesn't count. The electoral college that votes for him because uh, the founding fathers read Thucydides and they read Plato and they said, we must have, we must call our government a democracy, but not have a democracy because the mob will do things like invade Sicily. So this is a, a, an, a deception by Thucydides of major historical consequence. And you are the very first people to hear my exposition of Thucydides strategies and what he has done. He's an extraordinary writer. And I hope you might be inspired to read something that he wrote. He's very good. The translations are all bad because they don't, the translators don't understand. So they change it, the words into something that they do understand. And that's just really terrible. There is no good translation of Thucydides, but you, one can proceed in nonetheless. I have no idea what time it is. I guess because people have been leaving, I may have run over my time. I'm terribly sorry. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I enjoyed giving it to you. And thank you. Oh, yeah, there are questions. When Sparta surrendered, did they have to pay tribute to Athens? Uh, when they surrendered, no, I'm sure not. Um, no. The thing about Greece is victory. What was the question? Oh. Did Sparta have to pay anything to Athens when it surrendered? They, what they had to do was give over certain territories that Athens probably had always claimed as its own, as its own but that Sparta either wanted or claimed that it was their own. That was typically what people did. They, they, there were always little contests between city-states. They gave up territory. They gave up territory. Uh, right, dubious, was unclear territory like Taiwan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, another question? Yes. Uh, Athenians and the Spartans, they have two different political systems. Uh -huh. uh, the Spartan system was a very good you check and balance, uh, check and balance system. The, the Spartans. Spartans? Yes, the Spartans. The Republicans. 
uh, institution with very well check and balances. Actually, it's close to the American constitution, the Sparta constitution. And it's true that our founding fathers looked at now, Sparta. Yeah. Not any check and balance to if something a mistake happens to correct. Therefore, okay. after the death of Pericles, it was the destruction of Athens, the complete destruction of Athens. They destroyed themselves. Uh, now, the, is that? Uh, no. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than that. Athens had, for example, the Areopagus Council, which could. That's, that's in, yeah, true. Um, but um, there were, there were for, for example, you were not allowed to pass a law that contradicted another law. So there, there's a check. Um, you could, there was a procedure to pass, so if somebody proposed a law that was not judged suitable, they could prosecute for the law. Um, uh, we would all say, people like me and Mons Hansen, for example, and, and he says the fourth century was better than the fifth because it, it was calmer, it was more legalistic. You see, see now, yeah, you should read Hansen. He, right, he wrote a book called The Democracy of Fourth Century Athens. Uh, right. And, and the Athenian, the fifth century system wasn't worked out very well. Um, but the trouble is that um, uh, there is the so called age of the demagogues after Pericles dies. But we don't believe in this. Per Mons Moses Finley said Pericles was as much a demagogue as any of them. And he was the terrible, he, he was responsible for getting Athens into war with Sparta. So he destroyed his own city. And Pericles, Thucydides was so appalled by this because he loved Pericles that he pretends it didn't happen. Did he bankrupt uh, Athens? Oh, yes, completely was destroyed. Pericles? Um, was yeah, he took gold off sacred statues and melted it into coinage which that was legal, it was legal to do that. And they had to replace it, whether they, by the way, you can still buy coins made from the gold that was on the covered the statue of Athena on the Acropolis. Wouldn't that be extraordinary to actually? Where, where do you buy those coins? I don't know, they come up for sale every now and again. Um, I'll let you know <laughs> if I see one, but God, the cost would be phenomenal. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, this gentleman here who's behind. Yes, so uh, I, I didn't quite get it to what the gentleman said about uh, Athens, Sparta, they did it rather. I thought the Norwegian war did it, the uh, Sparta war, right? So, Sorry? Uh, who won the first Norwegian war? Uh, the, uh, the, well, the Athenians won the first part of it, which is called the Arcadamian War, 431 to 421. And then the war start, after Athens lost in Sicily, then the Sicilians came over and started to help the Spartans. And then this is what everybody feared in Athens. The, the, the Spartans got the Persians, the Phoenician fleet also to help. Because Athens strength and Pericles strategy was Sparta has no fleet. So they can march around wherever they want, but we'll just sail where they're not and attack them. So, and that's what did happen, but not very effectively because um, the, the Athenians didn't want to fight, the Spartans didn't want to fight. But at the end, the Spartans did win. And they got territorial concessions instead of tribute. That's, they didn't get tribute. And, the Spart and there was a, an idea from Athens' enemies to destroy Athens, but Sparta said no. It's too great a city. It's not nice. <laughs> it's uh, let's, 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 yeah, let's take first the ones we have not yeah. asked questions, and then we'll go back to that. Lesson from the Peloponnesian War for United States and China. I mean, <laughs> all those popular people yeah. say, what, what's 
your opinion? What lesson? Right. The Thucydides trap is based on a mistranslation of Thucydides, where somebody early in Thucydides says, war with Sparta is inevitable. And so we so therefore we must fight as soon as we can because we're in a stronger position. But that's not what that's a mistranslation. And uh, because a lot of the, the political scientists who read Thucydides don't know Greek. And so they just rely on these translations, and all translations are seriously wrong. What Thucydides says is not war was inevitable. They say it's going to be hard to avoid, which is a very different thing. Um, and so uh, now with China, so we have a mega superpower, which is a tyranny uh, across the ocean facing us that wants to become in the next century, the world's leading power. We don't want that. Um, so how do we prevent it? Well, that's too pessimistic. Yeah. I think that's the political stuff. That's the political stuff. It's a general also. The general is a very good historian. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the political stuff is that when a totalitarian system comes, comes they are going to fail immediately. And uh, that's the political, the political huh. stuff. Unfortunately, I find archaic and classical Greece so fascinating that Polybius, who writes in the Hellenistic period, and I, I've never read Polybius, unfortunately, but I know people admire him. Yeah, but what the Spartan system was is subject to huge debate, huge debate, and uh, we don't really know. So. Tell us yeah, about America and China. Um, well, how are we going to keep China in a box, which is what we need to do? We have one great thing in our advantage, and that is we believe in freedom. We believe in openness and tr free speech and tr open trade, and, and, and China does not. China oh, had one. You don't think so? Uh, let's, 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 let's go. Yeah. One, you're telling me um, you. So we've been, the US has been doing this now in the South Seas. Um, we've been, the South the Chinese have been going in and saying, we can, we'll lend you some money and all this, but you got to pay it back. And the Americans have convinced these South Sea islands not to do this anymore and to stay allies of America. So that's how we can prevail. Um, the thing about ancient Greece is there were aristocracies and there were democracies. The aristocrats were, were not terrible people. Um, they didn't believe in the ideologies that the, the democracy had, but they were not terrible people. Um, and they took their wealth and used it to help the community, which is very nice. I wish our rich people did a lot more of that. We all wish they would. What, what are these two people doing with a hundred billion dollars? Uh, well, they should give it to the people, but they don't. Uh, space. Well, that, <laughs> he watched too much uh, Star Trek. That's his no, problem. No, 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 no. Bezos went to space. Who? Bezos. Oh, oh right. Uh, right, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, but I'm talking about no, Musk. No, no, no. Right. Anyway. Okay, now, uh, who was next? Uh, the my the my ah, okay. Uh, could, could you say something uh, about the play that uh, it happens and the role of a parachute wall? Yes, the plague, this, you're, uh, this is an extraordinary thing. Uh, there is a wonderful scholar in Oklahoma called Kyle Harper. He studies plagues in antiquity. Uh, did this plague happen is the question. Thucydides says it did. 
but he is the only source. We have a lot of plays by Aristophanes and by the tragedians. Um, for example, in the Acarnians, Dicaeopolis says, this war is horrible. Look at what it's all brought to us. The plague arose supposedly because uh, all the Athenians had to move into the city and so that Sparta could come around and with its land army could do what it wanted to do, um, but they couldn't get into the city because the walls closed them, closed them off. Uh, but the result is a plague started. Thucydides says it led to a total destruction of the city. People stopped obeying the laws, people stopped worshiping the gods. It was terrible. Did this actually happen? In the Acarnians, Aristophanes lists the trouble that the war has brought, but he says nothing about the plague, and it was right in the plague time. Um, uh, they found some teeth, um, 150 bodies with teeth, and they looked at the, the teeth, and they decided that the plague, it showed signs of diphtheria, something like that. Diphtheria, might have been diphtheria. But I asked Kyle Harper about it. He says, that was bogus work. It was terrible work and the teeth have now disappeared. So we're not sure what to think about these teeth. Um, so the, the plague is a, has become a complicated issue, but I can show you things that Thucydides invented. And he, I don't wanna say he invented the play, but he, I do feel he exaggerated it. He says people stopped worshiping. Well, in most plagues, everybody gets really religious. They pray on their knees and, um, you know, in the French towns, they have these what are called oratoires, which are statues of religious figures in the corners because you couldn't come out of your house because you were sick. So from your window, you would pray to the gods that were in these oratoires. It's, it's a fascinating, currently a fascinating problem. And I don't know how it will come, how it will be resolved. And your other question? <clears throat> oh, okay. So do you think it's disputed if really it happened? Sorry? So it is dis disputed if really it happened? Um, my view is something happened, but it wasn't anywhere near as serious as Thucydides says, um, because Greek, you know, Euripides Hippolytus put on in 428, right in the plague time. It's a play about a young man who has a lot of male friends, but he's not interested in girls. And so Aphrodite gets mad at him and punishes him. In the middle of this disastrous epidemic, would this be something that anybody cares about? We see no reference to the plague outside of Thucydides, who was writing into the 300s. So it's a, it's a question. It is a question. Yes. You said that many of the 60 ships to uh, Syracuse. Well, how many men were working on 60 ships? Sorry? You said they sent 60, 60 ships. How yeah. many men are we looking at? Um, a trireme has 170 rowers uh, and 30 soldiers on the top. Now, sometimes these ships can hold troops. Um, and use of troop transports. So I'm not sure how many, what the size of the army would be, but given what the Athenians sent elsewhere at different times, it's a small commitment. Um, they would often send 150 ships. If they were gonna conquer Sicily with Syracuse, a major power to contend with, 60 is a puny number. And uh, so it again suggests they were not intending to conquer Sicily. So uh, what's extraordinary is Thucydides, when he has the Athenians, so they've got these two immediate tasks and they're supposed to conquer the island. He shows them to go out to Segesta against Selinunte in half a paragraph and he describes no fighting at all. Doesn't describe any fighting. 
And then he says they go to Syracuse and they don't want to fight the Syracuse. They go to Leontini and they don't want to fight the Syracusans who are trying to provoke them into battle. They don't want to do it. I tell you, they, were, they did not go there to conquer Sicily. What was the population of Syracuse? Uh, I don't know. Um, one problem with Syracuse is the modern city is on top of the ancient town. And so it's hard to know, to see populations, housing densities and things. So I don't know, and I don't know if we know. Um, it's a great city though. Oh, oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, regarding the rivalry between the United States and China. Yes. I don't think it's to the interest of anyone to get in the war. Because right. they're intertwined economically. Yes. I think if China loses the market to the United States, that yeah. would be Right. It's not my field, but I, I would agree. I'm sorry? It's not my field, but I would agree. Yeah. Judge. Yeah. I mean, everything we buy is made in China. Right. So if we cease buying Chinese stuff, where the Chinese don't buy it? I mean, obviously, there's other countries in the world, but they're not going to be able to replace it. Right. right. Um, but you would agree with me that what China has against it is it's a dictatorship and well, people have no freedom. Right. But I think it's more economic than. That's uh -huh. why they threaten uh, Taiwan and do all kinds of things, you know. Yeah. But they don't do anything. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Not because they're afraid, I think, that the United States is going to go and go to war in China. Uh -huh. But because there's going to be such a disruption in the, in, the, in, the, in the world economy. Yeah. Well, that's certainly true. Great. I have one more question. Yes. It, 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 I don't know if you're feeling it out. I don't know if you have a general who left. My opinion that the, the Spartans were communists. I, I don't know why like, the idea that they're balancing. Their, I mean, if they, 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 they took your kid at age eight. Yeah. And they were saying the kid belongs to the state. Right. That's pretty communistic to me. Yeah. Or what we would say is totalitarian. Sure. The state do absolutely dominates people yeah. on everybody's lives. That's right. Um, and uh, I know it was a, it was really a weird place, you know. When you got married as a Spartan, your let's see, your bride on the ma on the wedding night, the bride shaved all her head off, all her hair off, and waited in bed. And her husband climbed in through the window. Um, what is these are bizarre rituals. Um, so how they came up with this stuff, we don't know. Um, but uh, um, and they and, and they died out, as I say. By the three sixties, they were gone. Uh, really, an extraordinary, and that's the ultimate indictment of any society if it disappears. Um, so, but it was fascinating. Well, thank you all for coming and it was a lot of fun. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your ministry. Thank you very much. I would like to.